What will you do to unlock innovation? In today's fast-paced world, innovation might not be enough. Tomorrow's pioneers of change will need to be agile, able to adapt, and committed like never before. Your host, Santa Vending, invites you to listen in and join business leaders from around the world as they share their visions for success in our future business challenges. Welcome to Mind the Innovation. I'm your host, Sana Vinding. I'm always excited to learn. And in today's podcast, we're going to talk about design thinking and looking at problems in a new way. Um, I want to welcome Gabriel Yoder. He's a product portfolio manager with discovery and development at IPM. And he likes creating and solving problems through human-centered design. So, so welcome, Gabriel. I'm so excited to finally you have you on here today. Yes, thank you so much. This is, this is exciting for me as well. I'm happy to talk with you today. Good. So um, what, what's your passion? Because I, when I checked out your, your profile on LinkedIn, right, you, you have this, you, you, love, you love to solve big problems. So what, mm -hmm. what's the passion behind this? Yeah, so passion is a really strong word. I think it, it's, it's maybe overused, but I do think it applies here. Um, to, to me, my passion for solving big problems, it's all about impact. You know, I think um, I want to make a big impact in people's lives. That's the thing that motivates me. And it's the, it's the legacy that I want to leave. And big problems are really great opportunities to make a big impact. Um, the, the journey to solve big problems has a, just a lot of value in it. I think this is something that I knew early on, even though I, I probably couldn't describe it to you, just in going through life, that when people have big problems, we can figure out what matters to them the most and the things that they're unhappiest about in their lives. That's a great opportunity to step in and really help and make a difference. Um, and I think early on, as, as people started to kind of put ideas of how to solve big problems together as something that could be taught, they, they started to realize that the problems they were solving were important and people found value in it, but um, that the journey to solve those problems, there was as much value in that. And I think I've, I've really discovered the same thing, taking people through the journey to solve big problems. There's just so much learning that happens. There's so much that comes out of them about what they're experiencing. And um, that's just a really fun thing to be part of. Yeah. And I yeah. think it can truly be a passion because it extends so far beyond a job and work. This is, this is present in our lives every day. Uh, yeah. In every yeah. moment, you're going to come across something that there's a problem to solve and there's an opportunity. Uh, for impact yeah be ready to right be ready for the problems so yeah. how is uh, so, so connecting design thinking to to solving mm -hmm. problems so so how is this connected yeah so design thinking the thing i love about it is that um in design thinking it, it starts with empathy every time just really deeply understanding whoever you're focusing on and what it is that's going on um, going around them like what are all the different things motivating them and you know like like human-centered design which is you know the, the two are so tightly tied together um, I think design thinking was born out of this human-centered approach to design the the tangible benefits from that are just you get you create better value you create better products you better understanding always uh, lends itself to better results. Yeah. Um, and, and I think for me, too, there's a, there's a confidence that comes, comes from going through a process like design thinking where you're empathizing so much is you, you gain this confidence that you're doing the right thing, yeah. which is really important. Um, not just making the right decisions around solving the solving of the problem, but doing the, making the right decisions related to the person and what they really care about. Like there's a, there's like an ethical confidence that comes with it too. And like, that's, that's really irreplaceable. And the, the concept of it, it shouldn't be a surprise to people that this is something that works, that empathizing and deeply understanding what's going yeah. on in people's lives is important. I mean, when's the last time that you've been really thoughtful and considerate of someone any time in your life? And you were like, oh man, that was a really bad choice. <laughs> like this is, it, it usually ends up well when yeah. you, you put others at the forefront and you try to understand what's going on from their perspective. So um, 
kind of a co common sense, as they say, is not common. But the more I learn and study people who are making this really academic, I go, this is this is the stuff that my parents are trying to teach me when I was a kid. <laughs> it's, <not really> <laughs> it's full circle now. No, <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um so yeah so it, it 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 begins and ends with people right that's that's what you're saying yeah 100 yeah. mm -hmm. but what about so human-centered management is that same or is it how you actually are managing projects yeah so so to me the human-centered management again when i hear management i immediately go to people i mean this is what management is always centered around people and I would just describe it as applying empathy to management. When, when you're when you're managing a team, you know, whether you're focusing more on the people or the project, one of the most important things you have to figure out is what's motivating people. Because as much as we would like to to think that people should be really passionate about their job and the tasks that they're doing and the things that are required of them in their job description. Like that's really um, not realistic. And I know it's not been true of me in my own career. <laughs> Sometimes things I'm required to do that don't hit the passion, uh, they don't fit into the passion category, right? So you, human centered management to me, you understand what's motivating people, what they truly care about and you help them make the connections. You help them see the correlation to what they're doing. That's always been a, a really um, powerful tool that I've seen used is help people see the value in what they're doing, help them see that the things they care about, about do have a connection and, and also how the doing of the jobs that are required of them can help them meet their own goals. Yeah, and even beyond that, there's how do they respond? How do people respond to different types of communication? I mean, you have to be a student of people. You have to get beyond task management and just getting all the things on the checklist done to be a motivator and a help. Um, and to me, this connects really well to the whole jobs to be done theory that has kind of been born out of this design human centered world what are people trying to get done in work and in life yes there are functional jobs that they're trying to get done but oftentimes it's the emotional jobs it's the social jobs that they're trying to get done that are more important and um it, there's there's something to tapping into that i it's maybe a silly analogy but i think it's such a good one i, I often tell this when i'm trying to teach these principles uh, in our own company, the the book's Little House on the Prairie that they made into a TV show. I remember yeah. watching the pilot, the pilot show, and there's this point in the in the show where they've built their little house on the prairie, and there's a prairie fire just like rushing towards, you know, rushing towards their home. And I think, you know, if that was a business problem, the fire was a business problem most people would step into it and say, all right, there's the problem, it's the fire, we gotta put out the fire. That's the solution, we gotta put out the fire. But if you watch things play out, the first thing the family does is they go and take their youngest daughter and they go put her in the middle of the creek. Well, why do they do that? Their, their biggest problem to solve was not about the fire, it was about keeping their family safe, right? That was way more important than putting out the fire. And then they throw water on their house so that it doesn't catch on fire. That was more yeah. important than putting out the fire. And then in the books, yeah. they go and dig ditches to keep, you know, all these things. And you start to realize that the big thing that I saw that I thought was the problem was like the fourth most important thing. Yeah. Right? There were a lot of other things that needed to be done. And what we, both in human-centered design and in human-centered management, I think that's really exposing an important principle. You, you have to get to know people enough to understand what's really going on um, and if you do that well the value you can bring them is so much greater and yeah. it's really important yeah I, I like your storytelling there it's like bringing you back to childhood <laughs> as well um so i i think we all in, in product development if it's, it's human centered design you know you always have a journey Again, you know more today than you did yesterday. So, so what yeah. if, if you look at your learnings? Um, because I'm sure you've been on many projects. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the learnings that that stands out for you? Oh man, there has there has been a lot. 
I knew so little when I started and I just kind of started grabbing um, everywhere I could and, and learning by experience. Um, you know, I, I think one of the big things is that this, this approach, it, it's not just about a shift in thinking, it's, it's also a shift in, in doing, I guess. It, it's not just putting um, you know, someone's picture in the middle of a canvas and talking about what you think they're thinking, right? It's, it's bringing them in. It's, I, I consider myself to be pretty good in my ability to read people, but I can't read their minds, obviously. So um, my guess at what someone is thinking is not the same as hearing what they're thinking. So I think that was, a, that was a big learning early on. Early applications I saw of a human-centered approach were often just, okay, who's the customer? Okay, they're the customer. All right, what are they thinking? What are they seeing? What are they doing? You know, going through this empathy exercise, but it's a bunch of people that I work with guessing yeah. right? instead of truly going to them and getting getting really good at just asking questions and listening and not assuming anything. Yeah. Uh, just just really bringing them in. So that was, I think, that was a really big learning for me um, in this. It's not just thinking about a person, it's it's putting it in action, going to them and hearing it firsthand. And then I think the second thing, um, I don't know, I don't think this is controversial, but I really believe it strongly. And that, that's that genuine interest can't be faked. So to really do this well, to do human-centered design well, to do to put this into practice, you have to care. You have to care about people. If you want to be great at human-centered design, it's not this thing that you just turn on and turn off. It, it needs to be kind of become part of who you are. You need to be empathetic. Yeah. You have to always yeah. consider others' perspectives. You, you know, especially nowadays, I think this is really relevant because we live in a, well, at least, at least here in America, and I, I'm sure there's some, um, there's, there's some truth to this wherever you live, but we live in a world that's very attention seeking and obsessed with their own perspective um, that very much try to draw attention to themselves. I mean, social, social media is a big way where this has really been seen. It's obvious that people care a lot about what people think about them, mm -hmm. but it's always drawing attention to you. So to, to work on caring more about others than yourself it takes practice. And, it, and if you don't live it out, it's going to be really hard to do it well when you're trying to solve a specific problem in, in the workplace. So I think about like, practically, how do you do that? Like, how does that become something that you make more and more part of your life? I think everyone, you can think about a person in your life that you struggle to communicate with, or, you know, a friendship or a relationship that's kind of gone stagnant. Mm -hmm. And just think like, what questions would you ask that would yeah. give you insight into that person's world? Like, how would you, how would you enter into their space, put them at the center and just show that you have an interest in what's going on? How do you, you know, how do you move away from these conversations that are like a ping pong match of just trading opinions and, oh yeah, they said that, that reminded me of this. Now I need to offer my insight and just focus on dig digging deeper into what they said. Mm -hmm. oh, tell me more about that. You know, that's really interesting. It, it sounds so simple, but I really think this is a skill that's fading. Yeah. Um, and if we want to, you know, be experts at doing this and create value in, in the workplace, then we need to start practicing this all the time in our everyday life. And that really gets back to the passion. The first question you asked yeah. around passion for this, it's, it's why design thinking, human-centered design is so appealing is that it's just different. It's different than what we're used to seeing, I think. And it's maybe sad to say that, but I also think it's one of the, it's why there's so much, I have so much hope that other people will grab onto this because when you start practicing it, there's just a, an energizing that happens. It feels good. It feels good to look at people this way and to dive into their worlds. Yeah. So when you, when you teach in it, how do you make sure that they actually understand the problem? And, and I know you just gave the example, right? Um, um, with the fire, 
but yeah. but you, you, but and that's that's it's always good because you can see that but then it, when you then have the real problem in front of you right it doesn't look yeah. that simple that we just put water on the house right um so so what what is some of the advice um you give so so the team can understand to, to look at the problem and maybe also look further and and and, and see a bigger picture of it yeah i you know i really like I, I like um, tricks that are drawing from context. To, so just to try to try to draw a connection between another problem that people are more familiar with, um, that they can kind of make a connection back to what's going on. I, but the biggest thing is like this resistance to just jump to an idea. The import. I've been really fortunate. I, I think people in in my organization really grabbed on to the idea of what is the problem to be solved and putting that first instead of leading leading with ideas it's i don't know it, it's i think if you explain it if you can find a really good way to explain the difference between uh, solving um uh a problem that's not well defined and one that's very accurate or, or connects to a deeper need. Um, it's it becomes obvious to to the group of just what's uh, I guess the value the value that comes back. I mean, if you if I were to talk to a group and say, hey, you could either if I told you you could either be known for inventing the iPhone or the next flavor of Doritos, like what would you choose? <laughs> And you know, I think most people would say, ah, I think it'd be a little cooler to be the person associated with inventing the iPhone. And, and I think when you lead with ideas without understanding the problem, two things are likely true. One, you'll, you'll just be incrementally improving something that already exists because you're going to be working from an existing solution. So if you're starting with ideas, you're, you're starting from your context of what you already know. Um, and you're not going to do things that are truly great. You're just going to inch the ball forward. But also, I think what's true is that you're going to leave value on the table. The, the products you create, the solutions you come up with are just not going to be as good. You're going to miss something that could have easily been included, that could have made a bigger difference and impact. Um, so I, you know, there's really, I don't think there's an excuse for organizations anymore not to understand the problem. And to dig into it, like there's so many techniques that have been well documented. There's so, so there's expertise out there and asking good questions yeah. and diving in. And really, it's just it's laziness or pride are really the things that would keep you from doing it. Just thinking that you you know more, or the mindset that people aren't important that would cause you to skip that that step. So I I, I think it's just really. Um, it's something that that companies just can't afford to miss anymore, and I hope that most would realize that. Yeah, no, it's it's really really important. Um, all the learnings, right? When you get yeah. a team together and and learning to to look at at your problem in a different way, um, how do you make sure? I don't know if you can bring an example of the the knowledge that you gain and maybe the aha moments mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I'm sure it doesn't happen in one day, right? It, it's if you're mm -hmm. gathering this information, how do you make mm -hmm. sure that that you still have that core of information through your development of, of your product or your service? Um, that you don't saying, oh yeah, we did that in, in the early phase, right? But now we're here. How do you how do you make sure that that you keep the people <laughs> and all yeah. the learnings um, in the center? Yeah, I, I think I think maybe one of the easiest ways is just to con continue to involve the people throughout the process. Don't make it uh, a starting point and, and then let things linger um, without talking to them again. Yeah. You, you're, yeah. you're always going to learn something from people and you're going to have insight and you're going to take action on it, but um, things can change. And as a product is created, as, as you're creating a product, you're continuously learning more you're adding more and also the product's taking shape. So yeah. then the people you're creating it for can react to it. Like they can get, they can share things with you that they couldn't share at the beginning because they had no context. They didn't understand, you know, what you were going to create for them. They were just, they were speaking to you from their perspective and what they knew. 
And and so I think that's the the greatest way. Um, again, this is it, if it's something that you're not turning on or turn and turning off, but this is truly something that um, it is part of you. This this desire to be empathetic with people. Then the the learning is that you're constantly asking questions throughout and you're open to new information coming in and you're not getting set in the first decision that you made in the process. And so part of, I think part of adopting a learning mindset is the same as just adopting the human centered mindset. If you're truly human centered, you're going to be able to continue to learn things because you're going to value people's opinions at any point in the process. What about leadership um, to, to, to lead a, a group? Um, what kind of, of skill set do you do you need, or is there a new skill set you actually have to to uh, develop in an organization when you want to go in this direction? Yeah, so I guess the, the question being, um, it, it, it more what kind of person do you need to be, or can you develop into a person? Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, it leads so, to as well, you know, do you, are you born creative, right? Or can you actually be, can you be, can you teach somebody who's saying you can be creative? You don't have yeah. to, you're not born with it. So it, it's the, yeah, well, how, how to get around it. Yeah, well, so I, I really, I, I believe that both sides of that are true to an extent. I, I do think that there are characteristics that people associate with leadership that some people just have more more of at birth um, and it has a lot to do maybe not even at birth but just from kind of where they came from but it's 100 percent i this is something that you can learn that you can grow in um and i it's something i i've been thinking about more and more as i've gotten exposed to this and practice it at work like this is this is a mindset that i think um, I can in start instilling in my own kids at a young age, just to see the world this way, to think this way, to be a good leader. I, I, I actually think this empathy skill set, this human centeredness is such a critical part of, of being a good leader. People have had different terms over the years to talk about. Servant leadership was one that was really um, popular. And it, there's some differences, but the the point that you, as a leader, you would put other people um, first, focus on them, and view your role as not to lord over them, but to help them, help them be their best, help them to, to be fulfilled, help them to accomplish their goals. Um, that's That all comes back to uh, human centeredness and empathy. So when you're talking about that part of, of design and creativity, I think that's something that absolutely can can be taught. And the earlier the earlier you start learning it, the better. Because yeah. again, the longer you have to practice it, the long you just start adding all of these moments um, that are teachers. And the more moments you have, the more learning you're going to have, the the more opportunities to grow and be a stronger leader, to be more creative. But there, there's so much out there too. And this is something I, I've just been trying to learn a lot about lately is just unlocking creativity in people's minds. So some people, because they haven't thought this way for so long, they have kind of gotten accustomed to thinking a certain way, um, maybe being more rigid and thinking about things. I, I, I believe that everybody has creativity to be unlocked. And there's, there's activities you can do. And I'm struggling to think of some of them right now, but it, it's so... It's so important just to help people. That's the fun part. Why I love facilitating design events and things is because so much of the way I design those workshops is to pull things out of people's minds to help them see that there's more in there yeah. um, than yeah. they realize. And that they're not just valued for their job and like their function. They actually, where creativity usually comes from, it's from all of these other life experiences that make us unique. Um, and this is something I've been talking lately in our organization about. Uh, you know, we're we're a business consulting firm, and we have a lot of people who are project managers that are coming from engineering backgrounds or, or think in a certain way. And uh, you know, when I bring a group together in a workshop, I really don't need like the perspective of 10 engineers. <laughs> That's not <laughs> you have to bring shake us to it the out creative. of them. <laughs> but that, 
So yes, they're all the same in that they're all humans. <laughs> but you know, start digging digging into their history. Oh, like did you grow up on a farm? Did you yeah. grow up in the city? Uh, do you play a musical instrument? Are you yeah. like what? What are all the other things about you? Yeah. All right. Okay. In yeah. this workshop, I don't want you to rep represent the perspective of an engineer. I want you to think about yourself and all of these other areas that make you great and make you unique. That's where you come up with really creative solutions. Yeah. It's when you're yeah. drawing uh, connections between these things that no one else shares with you that are just part of part of your life, and you can connect it back to the business problem. Like that's that's the genius that everybody has in them because there's no two people that are the same. And uh, I, I sometimes joke about some of the things I, I did as a kid. I, I was one who was more around farms, you know, and, and uh, had a lot of rabbits, actually, as, as a child. <laughs> so what perspective do I bring as a rabbit farmer uh, to this business meeting that uh, is definitely unique from what other people um, would bring? So that's that's funny yeah you're like so how, how do you get inspired because if you have to teach right and and have these sessions and inspire a whole yeah. group i'm sure you need your vitamin pill or get in, inspiration from somewhere <laughs> i you know i i think maybe this is why i call i can truly call this a passion um because when i get to do this i don't really need to pump myself up just because i like it so much because i think part of it is just knowing that in the course of leading a team like this or in doing a session, I'm going to see light bulbs go on in people's heads at some yeah. point. And like that, just that reinforcement, that affirmation means a lot to me. I feel like those are the moments where I get really excited is when it's pretty obvious to me that I help someone make a connection, that the light bulb went on and it's yeah. obvious because their whole demeanor changes or they get excited for a second. People sometimes that are very calm and reserved when they have this new insight, they start talking a little bit faster. They, uh, <laughs> they, they kind of just, they start yeah. getting jittery yeah. and you, you read the body language and you're like, yes, like it worked, it. we did it. Yeah. Um, and I think just knowing those moments are coming uh, just gets, me, gets me excited about it. I, I know at the end of the day, I'm gonna be very tired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it gonna drains you. Out. Right. It does, it takes a lot out of you, but it puts a lot, it puts a lot into you as well. And I, I think that's, you know, maybe that's just indicative of this whole this whole concept. I, I make the connection a lot with human centeredness to relationships because obviously, like relationships are the thing where two people are connected to each other. They're being yeah. there's they're human centeredness going on between them, and like any any type of good relationship, including employee em, employer, you know, boss employee, whatever it is, those are all relationships. Meaningful relationships have this have this thing where both people are pouring into each other like there's not there's there's not like this uh, subservient role you're teaching somebody and you're learning from them yeah. and there, there's just so much in that I, some of my most satisfying moments as a worker have been where i have known that something i did impacted my manager you know, the, the kind of the reverse way that we sometimes think about these relationships. But when I know that something I said or did, it landed yeah. with the person who's yeah. my, my boss and it made a difference and I can see it and now they're changing behavior or they're doing something differently. That's super empowering. It's really exciting. And that's, that's what I hope just happens in these little moments over and over again, as you practice design and human centeredness is that you just help people just feed each other. You, you yeah. help them pour into each other in special ways and gain new insights and grow. And now all of a sudden that, that team, that workshop, that project is part of their experience now. Like that's something they're going to draw on the next time they're in a yeah. different situation, solving a different problem. Uh, it, it just really feeds itself. And that's, that's a really fun thing. Yeah. So you're, you're bringing like a, getting in making an impact that they will remember this situation or what they actually experienced, right? It's not just a form that they filled out. They actually were part of it. Yeah. And that's how you remember exactly. great learnings. I, and, and I, yes, absolutely. And I'm not naive enough to think that um, every time someone goes to, through a workshop uh, with me, that they're all coming away changed forever. <laughs> uh, uh, and it probably won't register as like the top 10 moments of your life, maybe for a couple, 
Yeah. Um, but it sometimes it's just the little influence. It's the stuff that people wouldn't even notice. Yeah. Um, how how it changed them or how it changed their thinking, and it it pays dividends. It, it certainly did for me. I, I I remember the first workshop like this I went into when when I. Um, you know, I spent, I spent years um, in the Air Force and then came to the business world after that. And I understood these principles. I couldn't put a name to them. It was just yeah. kind of hard on me. But I remember the first time I saw it in action uh, and it made a difference. I mean, it, it totally it directed me towards the passion that I now have and I've been learning. Um, so I know, I know there's potential in these, in these little moments to make a really big impact and maybe even change, change, change someone's career. Yeah. It certainly just didn't, start so. changing one. Right. And then it can go yeah, from, it. from there. <laughs> so, uh, what, what would you tell Gabriel? Like if you look at yourself and saying 10 years ago, if you had to give yourself an advice, what would you tell yourself? Oh man, 10 years ago. Um, Obviously, there's there's things that when you, people look back, I think um, we often look at, think about the things that we would change or do differently. Um, I think if I was talking to myself 10 years ago, I would just reinforce the thinking that led me to where I was. Um, it, you know, I I really didn't know what was coming next 10 years ago, um, and and my passion for de for design thinking human-centered design did not exist yet because I didn't know what it was. Um, and I was just trying very hard to make the next right decision for my family. And, and one of the things that I did then was not knowing what I wanted to do or what I wanted my job title to be or what field I wanted to go into. I just looked at what I cared about, which was people, oddly enough. So you yeah. see the connection there. Yeah, but I I wanted to find a company where I felt like uh, I could be there for a long time. That they would feel more like a family than a job. So I looked for that, and I, and I found it, and it's that's why I'm still where I'm at now with IPM. And at the time, I just I sometimes felt like I didn't know what I was doing in that job search and looking for the next thing. It, it felt really ambiguous. But I think if I could talk to myself ten years ago. I would say uh, you've made a lot of mistakes, but that was not one of them. Like you thought about that in the right way. And that, that's yeah. a good way to go about decisions is focus on what you know, um, make the next right decision and usually good things happen. And that's been very true for me. That's good. Um, thank you so much. I think it was lovely just to hear about, and I love your passion for people. This is just, it's just like, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much I need to do now. Not that I don't, I like people, but it's just the approach <laughs> that I, I really, I really like. So, uh, so thank you so much for, for being on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for just giving me a chance to, to talk about this. There's, there's not a ton of them, but anytime someone will listen, I'll, I'll gladly talk. So thank you very much. If you enjoy this podcast, maybe you'd like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure also to check out our website, mindtheinnovation.com. And remember, stay curious and keep learning.